America has no royal family, but we have a long tradition of political families. But the first political family was the Adamses. The first seven presidents had very few sons. George Washington was childless. Thomas Jefferson had daughters. James Madison had one stepson. James Monroe had daughters. Andrew Jackson was childless. But John Adams, the second president, had sons, and his eldest, John Quincy Adams, became the sixth president. The Adams family had been in politics since the dawn of the American Revolution. In 1796, John Adams would be elected president. Twenty-eight years after that, in 1824, John Quincy Adams would follow him in the White House. John Adams predicted it. In 1813, when he was 77 years old, he had an argument by mail with his frenemy, 70-year-old Thomas Jefferson, about the sources of political power. Adams said there were five pillars of aristocracy, birth, beauty, wealth, virtue, and genius. Any one of the first three, Adams added, could overbear the last two. Interestingly, the only two pillars that Adams could claim, virtue and genius, were the two weakest. Jefferson pooh-poohed all this. He admitted there was a pseudo-aristocracy of birth and wealth, but said voters generally chose the really good and wise. Jefferson naturally trusted voters. He had been elected president twice. John Adams had been elected once, but when he ran for re-election, he was beaten by Thomas Jefferson. But Adams would not give up. He recalled an occasion, 60 years earlier, when an old judge had asked young Adams to find election results in a newspaper. Adams read the winners. I expected as much, the judge said, for I have always been of opinion that in the most popular governments, elections will generally go in favor of the most ancient families. John Adams could not benefit from that fact. But after he had been president, John Quincy Adams could. But it was hard being a second-generation Adams. While you had the advantage of birth, you had to be a virtuous genius, too. For hour after hour, the crowds have waited to see this great pageant of empire. When John Adams went to Europe as a diplomat at the end of the Revolutionary War, he took his young son, John Quincy, with him. John Quincy hobnobbed with Franklin, Jefferson, and Lafayette. But when it came time for John Quincy to go to college, he was sent to Harvard. It was quite a letdown after Paris and London. John Quincy became depressed. John wouldn't stand for it. You come into life with advantages, he wrote, which will disgrace you if your success is mediocre. And if you do not rise to the head, not only of your profession, but of your country, it will be owing to your own laziness, slovenliness, and obstinacy. John Quincy got his act together. I'm glad that's done. Homework in every class but Miss Jackson's. But John Adams gave his son more than a leg up and a hard time. At the end of his life, he gave him an assignment. You all finished with it? Yeah, all I can get. I think I was supposed to do some English, but I don't know. And you better find out? Over their long careers, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson had quarreled about many things, from foreign policy to the proper size of government. One thing they had not quarreled about was slavery. Free states and slave states had won the revolution and endorsed the Declaration of Independence. They agreed that all men are created equal, but they agreed to disagree about what exactly that meant. 
In 1821, 85-year-old John Adams wrote 77-year-old Thomas Jefferson about that agreement. Slavery in this country I have seen hanging over it like a black cloud for half a century. I have been so terrified with this phenomenon that I constantly said in former times to the Southern gentlemen, I cannot comprehend this object. I must leave it to you. What we are to see, God knows, and I leave it to him and his agents in posterity. But John Adams had his own agent in posterity. By 1821, John Quincy Adams was Secretary of State, running hard for president. In four years, he would be inaugurated. In five, his father would die. Did father and son talk about slavery? Did John say, we had a deal with the South, that they would fix this problem? They haven't. Now it's your problem. When John Quincy Adams was president, he didn't touch the problem. But after he failed to be reelected in 1828, he ran for the House of Representatives, where he would not let slavery alone. He argued against new slave states, and he defended slaves who had rebelled on the ship Amistad. His biggest fight was against the gag rule, which automatically tabled petitions against slavery. Southern congressmen called them insulting. Northerners feared they were divisive. Adams wanted them recorded. In 1842, the House almost censured Adams for his obstinacy. Adams pulled rank. He called the role of Southern presidents he had known, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. They all abhorred slavery, and he could prove it if it was denied now from their own testimony. The House narrowly voted not to censure Adams. Two years later, in 1844, it repealed the gag rule. John Quincy Adams died in 1848 and was buried next to his father. The national argument over slavery continued through the Civil War. The Adamses had played their part. It was a political and philosophical question. It was also a family matter.